Hey everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, whatever this is. Um, my name is Austin Belzer from Austin B Media. Um, but if you're visiting here, you probably know that already, um, as is the name. Um, but I am here with A.B. Uh, Seidel, who is presenting the film um, Cram at the Austin Film Festival um, th uh, this upcoming week. Um, and yeah, uh, Cram is this, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but yeah, just uh, take it away, A.B. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you. Same. Um, so yeah, Cram is, uh, as you said, it is sort of self-explanatory. Cram is a movie about the nightmare I think all of us have had about school. Um, well, actually, I don't want to speak for you. Have you had this nightmare? I, I have had this nightmare multiple <laughs> times. I, I was a horrible student. Mm. Um, there was this one, like, if you got me in a, a um, room where I didn't like the subject, I would just fail that subject. Like, I think my last year, they told me I couldn't take science anymore. I'd t taken science all three years of high school. And they said, <laughs> you've got to do an elective. You have to do that. Yeah. Um, and I was like, no, I, I want to do chemistry too. Um, because I was really good at it. Um, I stumped my chemistry teacher once. Um, and um, yeah, I, it, it was this thing where I, I told him, I'm going to flunk this if I take this class. And sure enough. Yeah, I'm sorry you had that experience. I mean, I had very similar experiences. I was never a good student myself. Although I think one of the interesting things about Cram and the interesting thing about this nightmare that we wanted to explore was people who were bad students, as well as people who were good students, have all had this dream. and the movie really emerged out of this desire to interrogate what, why the hell we're all so afraid of school. It's supposed to be this place where we're meant to learn and in higher education specifically, where we're meant to learn the things that we're interested in. And yet we're so afraid all the time. Yeah, it's funny because I remember growing up in high school, they'd tell you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then they'd stick you in algebra. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I know I don't want to do that, um, but you, you stick me in algebra too. Anyways, I don't understand it at all. Yeah. And then, and then they like I kept asking my English teacher, um, like, "Hey, what is a paragraph? What is it? Like, how do I hmm. stop the paragraph after I've finished my um, thought, or can I just go?" at it and it's funny because i read a book i i believe i talked about this on my instagram um is called everybody writes by ann handler mm -hmm. i believe um have you read it i haven't read it now uh, i recommend it um if i could just transport the book to you i would <laughs> Thank um you. <laughs> and like there's this whole chapter on forgetting what you learned growing mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. uh the, the sentence structure just forget about it Talk, write how you talk. So wow. if so, if you're not done with that idea, yeah, sure, that's fine. But make sure it flows nicely, like how you would talk. Like if if you take a pause or a breath, comma, yeah, um, stuff like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just so interesting. And I guess this kind of leads into my uh, one of my questions. Um, you, that conversation Mark and his friends have in the library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like you've had that conversation, right? I mean, like, is this ADA or is this MLA or what is this? Um, because it feels very um, potent. It, it feels very yeah. rich. Um, so did that come out of one of your own experiences going to college or high school or anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, it's a great question. I, you know, and so first, I think for your audience, just want to quickly explain. You know, the movie's about this student named Mark. Um, he's not a very good student, and uh, I relate to him very closely in that way, certainly. Um, and he's, you know, struggling to finish his final final paper so he can graduate. Um, and uh, I'll suffice to say that um, he's he attempts to cram all night in the library, but the library does have some other plans for him. 
Um, and this this conversation you're talking about, which you know happens, it's the first scene in the movie. And I think there were two things there. One was yes, it's it's straight out of my life. This experience of studying with other people and being friends with people who are better students than I am um, for reasons that you know felt mysterious to me at the time. And it seemed like I was always struggling, but other people were just able to do the work and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Um, and I think that part of Mark really does come from me personally. This He's sort of, he's very lost. And I think he's at a place in his life where he has no idea uh, whether he even wants to change and if he were to, how he would go about doing that. And so um, the other part of it is I, I just, I think, you know, the movie is a horror movie and it gets pretty weird later on. And I really wanted to start, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I really wanted to start the movie in this very uh, lived in emotional reality. I think um, I wanted people to understand that Mark is a real person and his friends are real people. And while the movie becomes a nightmare and we enter this sort of dreamscape, uh, these are real people and real people are experiencing this all the time. Yeah, and you know, you, you critique a lot of that structure. Um, in this movie without getting into too heavy of a spoiler. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever feel like the the reason why you're a bad student, as you say, um, was ever because of uh, how you were taught? Maybe a professor just slammed a packet on your desk mm -hmm. um, would be the modern equivalent of it. Yeah, I mean, I think all the time, I, you know, and part of that was sort of a petulant childishness where, you know, I didn't want to take any personal responsibility. I was like, yeah, man, it's all the system. And, you know, <laughs> like, really, they're the ones who are messed up. And I'm, I'm great. And I think, you know, the reality, it was it was certainly both. I had a lot to learn, and I had a lot of maturity to gain. But I do think this is we, we live primarily in this country, certainly in an academic system that rewards the neurotypical um students who who are who can conform to a certain set of standards and punishes those who don't um, and that really has nothing to do with one's desire to learn or one's intelligence and i think I, I really wanted this movie to feel like the the trap of higher education that i think so many of us fall into um you know the, the goal of the movie is to unmask the the face the, uh, an uglier face of academia that i think exists behind you know, the veil of all of that pomp and circumstance that we're also attracted to and we see in movies growing up. Um, so, yeah, I do think there's a, a huge systemic critique in the movie. Um, and I personally take a bit of a cynical approach. You know, I believe that it's unfortunate that the place we go to to learn, which should be a very beautiful experience. And, you know, earlier in the interview, you were talking about this book you'd read, which sounds so educational and it was, sounds like it was such a rewarding educational experience. And those are experiences that we don't always have in school because instead, like you say, we're, you know, someone slaps a book, an exam book on our table and says, you know, it's all for this. And in the movie, there's a conscious effort to, um, you know, reference standardization of knowledge and how punitive and scary it can be where, you know, Mark is attempting to express himself, but throughout the movie, he confronts Scantron forms and exam books that attempt to like reduce his experience into this like, blue book and what does it mean <laughs> yeah i i've actually got you know you talk about scantron forms i've got some battle scars from some scantron <laughs> like once i got so bored i don't know if this will show up on a camera but there is a little piece of lead in the center of my palm oh, because wow. i got so bored i ended up like just pushing a mechanical pencil uh into there wow <laughs> and then like <laughs> One of my fingers is like misshapen because I was holding a pencil for so long. Yeah, I think it's this one. Well, I won't show that because that would be flipping somebody off. But um, sure. <laughs> um, but like, it, it's wild. It just, it, it is, I, yeah, anyways. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's a universal experience. You know, I, I, at least in, in the US, I, you know, I, I hope that school is better in other places, but for most of us, it's it's really universal. And I, I just think it's so unfortunate that school is scary and difficult because it shouldn't be. No, I, I, like um, going back to that book, I feel like that's going to be the theme of this interview. We're just talking about a book now. Um, <laughs> but it's, I, I grew up reading books like Where the Red Fern Grows and you mm -hmm. had to have book reports 
And the reason that would be rewarding is you were just kind of half reading for your own benefit, half reading for, hey, I want to get to middle school so I can be out of here. Yeah. Um, but like, I think, let's have a discussion on teaching styles. But no, um, I, I, it, it's intriguing how teaching is reinforced and negatively reinforced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure we could have a symposium about that, but it's just like, <laughs> It's interesting because the the reason I ha I went all science pretty much is because a I understood it uh, from a logic I'm a very logical person mm -hmm. I am yes or no if then uh, yeah. kind of like a machine in that way um, and so when you tell me okay this roller coaster is here and it's got to be here and that's all you got to do is mass divided by volume or I, I forget but um it's been a while since i've been in sure, sure. can you tell um <laughs> but uh it i think the reason our school systems are quote unquote messed up mm -hmm. is there's no engagement and we've got to find better ways to engage um because science engaged my brain it's like oh yes that's the logical sign of my brain just lit up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, the question of motivation that you point at where you're like, I'm there to just get through to middle school or to high school or to college or to get the degree, whatever it is, that's really, you know, even the people who are doing well in school will probably, if they're being honest, say that they're there to get their degree. Yeah. And they're not there to learn. And and I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting a degree. Clearly, you know, they, they have some they have some utility in our world. Although uh, I would argue that, you know, the ridiculous amounts of student debt people are saddled with perhaps offsets that utility. But I think that that question of motivation was one of the big things we wanted to explore. You know, what does it mean if school isn't a, a, the, a, a venue targeted towards education, but is instead a venue targeted towards producing people like a machine, like a factory for, you know, society, um, like to, to just function as cogs in this greater machine. Um, and there is something vampiric about the education system then where, you know, uh, it is fe like feeding on young people and their money and all of their money uh, in the purpose, you know, of turning them into more vampires that, you know, just perpetuate the same messed up system that we're talking about. Yeah. I, Oh, for sure, man. I I totally get that. I mean, yeah, um, yeah. because I, I I witnessed one of my friends who she's a nurse, mm. and she's like, I got to drop out of school because I'm wow. trying to do a a job and this, and I'm just exhausted. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, she's like, yeah, she's been through a lot. Um. Yeah. It's. It's also funny because so I'm sorry to hear that, by the way, my partner's a nurse as well, and she's also had a difficult <laughs> time. It's it's not an easy time to do that type of work. Yeah. It's and moments I mean, like that where I feel very grateful to make movies. Yeah, I mean, same, but with like just opening up my laptop and just typing words onto a blank canvas, so to speak. Yeah, sure. Um, it's funny the the point you made earlier about just to make one comment on this you talked about you know you're a sort of logical person um and a, a rational thinker and uh, i am too actually which may be surprising i'm having watched cram <laughs> but uh i think cram kind of consciously flies in the face of reason in a lot of ways because one of the things i wanted to evoke was one the sort of dream like quality i wanted it to feel like a dream but also school never made sense to me the experience of sitting in school was this yeah. fundamentally irrational experience and I wanted people sitting there watching Cram to think, what the hell is going on? And then think, wow, this is exactly how I felt when I was sitting in class. Yeah, that's actually one of the notes I, I made is like, it's a perfect metaphorical representation of how it feels cramming. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Especially there's a moment where he's just, this is early on, so no spoilers yeah. at all, um, where he's staring at his computer screen and he's just like underlining nonsense and it's just like yeah i've been there and like i thought i i was so cool and so hyped and then i came into the 
uh, school the next day and then you look at your word count or you look at what like the show your work section and you're like oh i know nothing yeah i know absolutely nothing especially when you get to map testing i don't mm -hmm. know if you're ever, ever a part of that but um it, it's just brutal yeah but um so This is going to sound like a kind of uh, typical question. Sure, but, sure. And I'm sure one you'll get over the week um, as Austin Film Festival develops. Um, uh, what, what, so you, you take a very old school horror vibe to mm. this movie. Like I'd say 1980s, 1990s, somewhere around that era. Um, what, what films did you look for for that horror inspiration? Because it's not as quite as apparent when you say, oh, this is a movie about cramming for a test. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great question. And, you know, first of all, thank you for referencing that time period. It's a time period that does mean a great deal to me in horror filmmaking. I think horror films of that moment, um, the original Candyman in the 90s um, is another movie part actually about academia and about, you know, voyeurism of higher education. Um, I think it's a masterpiece. Um, and that was a movie I referenced all the time. Um, and as far as, you know, dreamlike qualities, uh, obviously A Nightmare on Elm Street is, I think, one of the quintessential nightmare movies. And sure. the way that movie conveys like dream logic, I think is so masterful. There's one shot in Nightmare on Elm Street where, um, you know, it's a character like is walking down the street and all of a sudden there's a door just in the middle of the street and opens the door and walks through and you never really question it while you're watching because you're like oh she's just walking through that door but if you step back you're like what the hell is a door doing there and it's this <laughs> incredible evocation of, of dream thinking and, and dreams and that was something i really aspired to in cram i wanted it to feel like you were asleep um and your mind is working in the same way um and as far as the approach though i think you know when we realized we wanted to make a movie about and by the way i haven't said this yet i should you know, movies aren't made by one person. Uh, so many people worked on Cram. Um, and I don't do anything by myself. I, I don't think I'd be capable of doing anything by myself. That was part of the reason I was a bad student. Um, so when I say we, I'm talking about myself and I'm talking about my co-executive producer, Felix Hanta, who's also the cinematographer of the movie. And my co-producer, Trevor Wallace, who co-edited who edited the movie with me. Um, and Zachary J. Bailey, our producer. And, you know, obviously so many other people in our cast and crew, which I'm happy to talk about. But um, we all realized that, you know, horror is this incredible way of talking about big ideas in a way that's fundamentally accessible and visceral. So we could tell a story in a way that's, you know, designed to make people laugh or scream or cry or just feel whatever. And at the same time, hold a light to some of these collective fears and traumas we all have about school. Um, so in the hope that maybe a horror movie could exercise some real demons. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that last part where you talk about um, horror movies kind of standing for a bigger thing. That actually calls to mind a movie called, uh, have you seen Censor? No, I haven't. It's really, I've, I've seen it twice. I saw it once at Sundance and again when it came out. Um, it's kind of dealing with a similar kind of metaphor. Mm -hmm. I won't spoil the metaphor. Um, and I think Possessor did it last year as well. Um, yeah, it's it very metaphorical. Um, but going back to the crew thing, yeah. um, I, I think it is very important to highlight, again, that this isn't just made by Abby. Um, this is made by probably, what, dozens of people yeah. um, over a course of, I, I would assume, three or four years at the very least. Um, just just for the makeup, really. Um, <laughs> uh, like, especially, yeah. I, well, I won't spoil what makeup, but- We can um, talk about it obliquely, you know? The, yeah. the main guy. There's some monster makeup in the movie. Yeah, it, where it's just wild. You're like, wait, I can tell this is something, but my brain can't wrap my mind around it. Um, and that brings me to the cinematography. You have yeah. this one beautiful shot. Thank you. Um, where um, Mark 
I believe his name is, um, mm -hmm. is going down the stairs. I, I don't know what you would call it, so apologies to the cinematographer who's probably watching this. Um, it's like a split shot where yeah. the monster's on one side and the mark's on the other side. Yeah. I don't do cinematography. So how do you do that? How did yeah, you, how, how was that shot? Yeah. So just to kind of help paint a picture in, in people's minds, and by the way, feel free to, I, I can, you know, get you a still of that shot. Okay. Um, but, you know, there's a shot in the movie where in the foreground, we have a very large hand. And then on the other half of the frame, we have Mark standing there. And there's sort of a bit of a forced perspective going on where the hand appears quite large in frame yeah. and Mark appears, you know, full body. Um, and that's, we're using an old optical technique called a split diopter. Um, yeah. And so what basically all that work and, you know, uh, again, credit to our cinematographer, Felix Hanta, who I think is just an absolute genius. And he, I've known him since high school, by the way. And part of why we, you know, made this movie together um, and we've been making movies together since high school is we made this movie because both of us struggled in school and wanted to exercise our own demons. Um, but with that shot specifically, um, a split diopter is basically a magnifying glass, but it only covers half of the lens. And so whatever you're focusing on, um, you're actually focusing on two different things at different planes of focus. And so we were able to have the hand very close to the lens and mark okay. further away and both are in focus. Yeah. So like, yeah, that, that's fascinating. Um, and like for, for those at home, like basically you see the split right in the middle of the screen. Um, if I, if I did my editing, right. <laughs> um, so it, it basically looked like, let me make sure like the nails are like right here and then, yeah. And then like, I'm just, walking down the stairs, yes. but like just reverse that. And, um, oh, this is going to be a pain for editing me. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it's such a fascinating shot because, and I think horror movies are where you get to experiment a lot, yeah. um, with cinematography mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's so fascinating. Um, thank you. And, you know what? Yeah. And because, especially with smaller films, although I don't think we should be saying any big, any film is bigger than any other. Um, okay, I got to ask, when are yeah. you making this a full film? <laughs> say, say tomorrow. Oh, well, thank you for asking that um, and for expressing that desire. I, I'd love to, you know, I, I think what's interesting about Cram is, you know, you're pointing to, it, it's an unusual length. It's a medium length movie. Um, about 44 minutes? Yeah, so it runs about 45 minutes long. And, you know, uh, this might be a disappointing answer, but I actually, it's that length because that was the length of the story we wanted to tell. And, you know, I, I respect that totally. I, I 100% because I, I have this debate on Twitter every so often uh, when some movie's runtime is being revealed as a super long runtime. I yeah. think the last time I debated it was No Time to Die, which sure. was like, Almost three movie. hours, yeah. Um, which I felt was fine. I so I think that brings up a conversation about editing. Yeah. Um, because I can watch a ninety-minute movie and it can feel still feel thirty minutes way too long, or too short even. Um, like I watched My Name Is Polly Murray, mm -hmm. uh, the documentary about well Polly Murray from Amazon Studios, and my main remark there was. This needs to be a mini series. I'm not mm. getting the full picture of who Polly Murray is because you're just whizzing by all yeah. the, all these ma major events, and you've only got 90 minutes to tell it. Just give do the Naomi Osaka thing where it's a mini series of like 10 yeah. episodes. But yeah, I, yeah. It's. I think I editing is the name of the game. You're right. I mean, working with Trevor, uh, my co-editor. You know the the standard we held ourselves to in the edit was always to do what we felt was right for the story and not to try to fit the movie within any sort of runtime, longer or shorter. I mean, knowing that when you make a 45 minute movie, uh, you're sort of setting yourself up for challenges down the road. Um, obviously the Austin Film Festival and and our world premiere this week is as a feature film and I'm, I'm so grateful and over the moon for that. Um, and there are other festivals that will screen it as a short film. And 
I think we're in this weird middle ground that is sort of untested and new, uh, at least to like American audience goers. Yeah. Um, and I think it's an exciting place to be. Yeah. And, you know, I, it's kind of weird because, you know, my own rules for the real awards are my own version of film awards. Is, sure. Um, is it's got to be like an hour. Mm. But like I've seen a few films, documentaries even, that um, at, oh, I, I, I lied before in our pre-interview. AFI Docs was not the last um, film festival I went to. Mm. I went to the Nashville Film Festival. Um, yeah, just a month ago. Um, well, went um, <laughs> virtually. Um, and there were a couple docs there that, um, one was about Colony House. Hmm. Um, the Christian rock band or however they describe themselves. And I was 59 minutes long and I'm like, <laughs> one more minute and you would have been in there. But also I, I have a feeling like they were also like releasing it as a YouTube series too. And I was like, yeah. okay. So you talk about blurring the, the lines and I think, I, I guess this brings up an interesting conversation about how do you think runtime should be experimented with. Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a great question because it's sort of as as a filmmaker, it's kind of nuts to me that movies are only allowed to have, you know, two runtimes, like 15 minutes and 90 minutes or two hours, whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, well, there's a whole space between there for stories that can be really meaningful that I think uh, that, you know, and, and I think classically the reason medium length movies aren't um, made is one, they're more expensive than short films. And so independent filmmakers like myself, um, if you have enough money to make a medium length movie, then maybe you can stretch that and make a feature. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other reason is exhibitors and distributors often feel that people won't pay money to see a medium length movie. Yeah. Like I rented um, The Year of the Everlasting Storm, which is distributed by Neon. And the runtime on Apple TV is two hours, 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. But that's just because they put a bunch of shorts together and edited it as, as one big movie. Right. And it's like, just let me like rent a bundle or something yeah. like that. I feel like there's like an Apollo Eleven quarantine. I, have you tell? Have you? Uh, can you tell? I've been going through the all the movies that have come out this year. I'm sure. I mean, it's your is, job. Is, is it noticeable? <laughs> um, but. That's a short film essentially because it's like 45 minutes or something yeah. like that. But they, in their film stab, that's where it is. It's not short films. So it's, right. it's a very interesting discussion. And I think that that opinion that I just expressed that I've heard from you know distributors, exhibitors, I actually don't think it's true. I think that people, I think there is an appetite for movies of all lengths. And at the end of the day, people just wanna see good stories. Yeah. And if you have a 45 minute movie, then, well, the advantage of that is, and I'll, I'm saying this for what it's worth to anyone in Austin, you know, we're screening on Friday night, you have time to grab dinner before the movie and get drinks afterwards, and it doesn't take up your whole night because it's only 45 minutes long. Yeah, I, I should say that um, it's, it's going to be screening on Friday, October 22nd at 7.30 p.m. at St. David's in Austin, Texas, uh, as part of the Austin Film Festival, and the same night um, on Eventive, they're digital platform, um, which is, well, technically, I just watched it. So technically yes. not where I'm I'm watching it, but technically, yes. Yes, thank it's, you. <laughs> it's a weird situation. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think there are, we need, we need to have that conversation of, okay, what constitutes a film and what constitutes a short? Because there are times where I'm watching a 30 minute short where I'm like, this is kind of a movie. Yeah. Um, because anywhere past 15 and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting like, okay, I'm in it for the long haul kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, it's a very interesting conversation. I agree. Um, but and yeah. thank you for the plug, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. people, if you're in Austin, 1045 PM, Friday, October 22nd. And yeah. And I'll, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, and yeah, and just like you said, it is available virtually as well for all the, you know, one of the amazing things to come out of the pandemic is 
the increasingly hybrid is a hybrid film festival model. And I think, you know, one of the benefits to a movie like Cram is it does where maybe it doesn't fit as gracefully into the tra traditional theatrical release. It does certainly fit into a streaming release and you can sample that starting on Friday. So I hope people watch it. Yeah. And I, I, I do think it, yeah, it does kind of fit nicely into that kind of slot um, of this is streaming literally no, no reason not to exactly the rules um, are all made up yeah like that's fascinating i, I can't like, anyways but it, it, it that is such a fascinating idea um but i i wish i had more time to talk about it yeah. um but my my week is getting crazy how about <laughs> yours um how are you feeling I'm feeling, you know, excited to go to Austin. We leave in a couple days. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to being there. And, you know, having made this movie during the pandemic, uh, this will be my first time seeing it with an audience, um, yeah. which is, I'm, you know, frankly, very nervous for, but also really excited for. Yeah, and I guess, I, I, I guess that kind of leads into a question I didn't ask, but I feel like I should ask now, like, how does it feel premiering at this festival? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm so I'm endlessly grateful to the Austin Film Festival for for putting its faith in Cram. I think you know we're, this screening is our world premiere. Um, yeah. It's Austin is an incredible festival for a lot of reasons, um, but in particular, I think they've highlighted a sort of dynamicism in storytelling over the years and championed you know new and emerging voices who are telling stories in interesting ways. So to be recognized in that context means just the world to me. I think Cram. Uh, is a movie that takes a lot of creative risks. Um, and, you know, we knew going in that that would leave some people hopefully really liking it, but other people not liking it. And, you know, we didn't set out to make a movie that would please everyone, but we did yeah. set out to make a movie that would, you know, make people feel real things. And uh, yeah, it means the world to me that the folks at Austin um, see something in the movie and and I can't wait to bring it to audiences in Texas. Yeah, you, do you need any uh, long haul tips um, <laughs> from somebody who was a uh, part of a few this year? Sure. Uh, hydrate, hydrate, yeah. hydrate. Um, Always a good one. Because you start getting crazy after after your like third day, it it like you just start like the lines just start blurring. You might have a similar experience to when you hit, see in cram. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> it is like I'll see four or five uh, festival films in a day, wow. um, full length, um, two hour movies. And I'll be like, what, what movie did I see at 9 a.m. this morning? What was it called? Like, even today, I'm like, what, what's my next interview? What, what is it called? Who is it? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, um, other than hydrate, um, yes. food, 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 snacks. It's always important um, to eat, yeah. <laughs> um, like even if you've got like a kind bar in like your pocket or something yeah. like that, um, that's another thing. Um, do you have time built in to rest? You know, in the first few days, not so much. One of the um, big challenges of a film festival when you're a smaller, more independent filmmaker uh, and filmmakers like our team is driving people to the screening is really our responsibility. So I wanna make sure people show up and you know, there are movies made by people whose names people know at this festival, and I'm not one of them. So yeah, <laughs> a lot I, of work cut out for us. I may have emailed a few studio contacts and be like, hey, I know I'm not like going to be at the French Dispatch, but, you know, could you lend me a hand? Could you? For sure. Could you, could you give me a screener? Is that possible? <laughs> like, like one I'm super bummed about is like the humans and come on, come on. Um, but yeah, like the PR person was like, nah, we, we ain't doing that. Yeah. But I mean, speaking of those movies, another amazing thing about playing Austin is just knowing, you know, we're in such good company. Uh, oh, yeah. Playing alongside filmmakers like Wes Anderson and Mike Mills is really extraordinary. You know, and it's funny you just mentioned Wes Anderson's name because I'm like, oh, right. I, I keep forgetting his name. I keep thinking Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm. And like what is that director's name and i'm like oh wes anderson yeah because the only wes Anderson i had a grudge 
against uh, Paul Thomas Anderson for the longest time. I just don't like his movies. Oh, interesting. Um, so I was just like, if I if it if it's an Anderson movie, I don't want to see it. And then Isle of Dogs came out, and I loved that. <clears> so, but uh, anyways, I I want to thank you so much uh, for your time, Abby. Um, a A B, sorry. Hey, no um, and. I really appreciated talking with you for however long we did. Um, <laughs> it felt like a long time, but um, but I always like talking to filmmakers, getting their insights, because when I'm just writing these things on my laptop, I don't think I get the same experience um, that I do, or just watching these at a film festival, I don't think I get that same experience where it, it that insight into how filmmaking actually works instead of I didn't like this because that's not how I would write the story <laughs> you know because I can get like that sometimes and I think it's important to have these conversations about what makes a film what is a film yeah and all these small micro microcosms of conversation that you know if you just pop a movie on on Netflix or HBO Max like I'll probably pop on Dune later this weekend and be like, I won't even think about it. And then I'll be like, oh yeah, somebody spent like an, a weekend away from their kids just to work on the VFX for this little sandworm. Yeah. Make sure the sand fell right off the sandworm just right. No, I so appreciate you saying that because it really is true. Obviously earlier we talked about our crew a little bit and you know the degree to which movies are not made by one person, they're made by many. And you mentioned some of our special effects makeup and I can shout out Beatrice Sniper, our, our special effects makeup artist. And just the intricacy of everyone's work is the sort of thing that you know if everyone's doing a great job, in some ways it becomes invisible uh, and yeah. that's the goal. But the downside to that is that there are these incredible artists whose work goes unnoticed because it's yeah. working. Um, so yes, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me and taking the time to talk. I really feel the same way, you know, having made this movie for, uh, over two years alone, um, not, not alone, but, you know, uh, alone and isolated in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, it's such a gift to finally be talking about the movie with, with people who were able to watch it. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. And just as a reminder to everyone watching slash listening, uh, the Pram is screening on Friday, October 22nd at 7 p.m at St. David's in Austin, Texas, and will be available on Eventive that same day. Uh, and I believe Eventive, that platform, go it won't expire until the end of the festival. But once you click play, it's 48 hours. I'll have to check on that. Yeah, I can confirm. One quick correction, sorry. It's just the, the movie's um, in person. It'll be 10.45 PM, actually. It's sort of oh, this spooky midnight thanks thing. Thanks for correcting. No worries. Um, but, you're correct that online in the virtual screening at, on Eventive, uh, it's available from that point to the end of the festival. So you have almost a week to watch the movie, but once you uh, click purchase, you have 48 hours. Yeah, and really, it's really easy to get a badge if you don't want to go to Austin, Texas. It's and it's really cheap. So yeah. for in film festival talk, that, that is. Um, but I mean, it's nothing like Sundance where you're paying a thousand dollars. Yeah, um, but. Anyways, thank you, thank you so much, Abby. Um, Ab, sorry. Um, it's okay. But may, maybe uh, talking again the next time you have a new uh, anything to work on. Thanks, Austin. I, I I hope we get to talk again too. Yeah, same. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem.